Um, I want to welcome everybody to the Clinical Trials Toolkit Series, um, Navigating E-Consent Scenarios for Clinical Research. Um, before we get started, um, let me, okay, thank you. Um, we are um, providing um, CEs today, so if you do want CEs, I need you to put your name, um, email address, and indicate if you want CEs, but just for attendance purposes, if you would go ahead and put your name um, in the chat box, I would really appreciate it. Um, our presenter today, you all know her, um, Debbie Lee. <laughs> no, pressure. <laughs> no pressure, Debbie Lee. Um, she's a training manager for Clinical Trials Center of Excellence, um, where she has an oversight of the Principal Investigator Academy and training associated with the Center of Excellence. Um, she has over 17 years of experience in the research industry at a contract resource research organization prior to joining WVU in 2018. Um, a fun fact about her is she lived on a farm when she was up until she was nine and she had a pony and his name was Pony. I love that. And I got to see a picture. So um, I did Rosemary join? Okay, Rosemary Castile is supposed to be also joining us today. Um, she's from the WVU um, OHRP continuous improvement manager and special assistance to the VPR for technology planning and management. Um, before we get started, Debbie is going to do her presentation and she's going to have questions at the end. So if you have anything, you can put them in the chat box and I'll let her know. Or um, when she gets to that slide, you can unmute yourself and talk to her directly. Okay. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Debbie. Well, hello everyone. So now you all know how creative I am with names um, or not. So a second here, just to share my screen. Um, and like Carrie said, please feel free, um, if you'd like to, feel free to um, put questions in the chat as we're talking. Carrie um, is actually going to be watching our chat for us, so feel free to stop me, ask me questions. Y'all know I love discussion, so feel free. Um, I do have two people in the room. I'm super excited. Um, yay! <laughs> so I'm also excited for everybody that's on Zoom, but it's just nice to see faces face to face now, so a little bit, so. All right, with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, we're navigating the e-consent scenarios for clinical research. Um, some of our objectives today, we wanna to understand the process differences between e-consent and like traditional informed consent, right? How exciting was it that we could go to e-consent with COVID? Um, because I, I, I sat in on a um, e-consent training um, and it was a big discussion because you can't take stuff in the room and how, you know, how does that work? So, um, and we want to talk about how to learn how to consent in person or via remote as well. Um, and then some of you, thank you all. Um, I talked to some of our coordinators at the Center of Excellence um, and also talking to our quality staff. Um, I do have some lessons learned, um, but once again, at the end of the session, please feel free to share your lessons learned, or maybe it's a lesson, but maybe you haven't learned it yet. So feel free to ask us questions. All right, so let's talk, talk about the informed consent process. So just the overall informed consent process. It is a conversation, right? It's not just a piece of paper you're gonna hand to your um, subject, potential subject and say, hey, just sign this, right? We don't do that, right? We wanna have a conversation. Um, so with that, okay. um, we also wanna provide sufficient time and opportunity, right? Um, because, and if you notice, I said potential subject, right? Because we don't know yet. Um, you might get to page four of the consent and you tell the patient that they're gonna get four blood draws and they're like, um, I'm a, I, I don't like needles and they're out, which, is totally their right to do so. Um, and we don't want them to feel pressure either, right, at any time. Um, allow the subject to talk with their fa family, their friends, their colleagues, their healthcare providers, because they might be coming to you as a specialist and you're in emergency room, right? 
Yes, sir. okay. So they might be coming in there because of something else going on and you're not their primary care physician that knows all of their history. Not, not that you guys don't take a history, but I can't remember some stuff that happens to me, right? So um, they might wanna go back and talk to their provider um, to, to do that. Um, my, my mom is in a study um, at UPMC. Um, God bless that coordinator um, because she took the informed consent home and no lie, an entire page of questions she wrote out down to, because we all know Pittsburgh, kind of like WVU, where is my daughter going to park the car and does she have to pay for parking? I mean, she had, you know, tons of questions. So we definitely want to provide that same thing to our patients here. Um, good communication techniques um, still apply to e-consent, right? And for e your e-consent, um, it might be in person that you're doing electronic informed consent. Or it could be you're over Zoom with that person or talking to them on the phone. But we still want to do those same things as, just like we were in person face-to-face. -face. So what is e-consent? Um, it's providing a mechanism to share written or interactive information. Um, we also have the ability with e-consent to evaluate the subject's comprehension. Um, so we could put in... Um, kind of like an assessment, I apologize, I don't know if that's the right word, but just to comprehend if they really understand what's gonna to happen to them. Um, because I, I know, I, I saw some um, Cancer Institute um, individuals on, you know, their consents could be pages and pages of information. So making sure they understand. And then also it's documenting your informed consent. So it's doing that for you as well. Um, it could be composed of multiple steps um, to ensure informed consenting. So maybe your informed consent is five pages, but when it goes electronic, there's different screens that they have to kind of go through um, as they're doing it. Um, and we want to identify, so there's multiple steps for that, but also to identify verification of the subject, right? Because you want to make sure you're speaking to that actual subject. Um, presentation of the consent documentation. So with it being electronic, you're documenting that that consent was completed as well. And then certification of submitted responses, right? Because it's electronic. It's not where they have to fill in a bubble on the informed consent or something like that. Um, I don't know about you guys, not informed consent, or RS, even RSVPs, people don't answer the questions correctly all the time. You guys, everybody that's attending this did, so we're good. So, but you know, it's human, you know, human error. So, um, and it also relies, and this is like the woo, big part, right? Relies on digital electronic signature. So, you know, your patient also could live hours away, you know, and they did come in to see you um, and they may qualify for this clinical trial. So now we're able to potentially consent that patient instead of having them come all the way back in for that. So um, as, as I mentioned, my mom is in one at UPMC, you know, I had to go drive and get her out of Uniontown, then fight the traffic and get in. So it was always an adventure. So how is e-consent different? Because it is different. Um, as we all know, um, when COVID hit and the university shut down, I think, I'm sure things change at the hospital or in your departments. Well, some of you guys are at home right now, right? Um, e-consent's different as well because there's a difference in time needed, right? Carrie and I were in here 30 minutes before this presentation, right? Things go, technology's great when it works correctly. So, um, so you do still need to practice before you do that consent, because maybe during the process, you want to be able to share the consent, um, kind of how I'm sharing the slides with you guys today. Do you know how to do that? I'm sure you all do now because we've used Zoom, but you might be on a different platform like WebEx that, you know, it's kind of the same, but buttons are in different places, things like that. Um, you also want to make sure you verify their email address, right, um, and their access to technology. Um, so my first thought is my mom would never have been able to do anything technology, right? So making sure that that is a possibility for them. Um, participants spending more time reviewing the consent because now you may have sent it to them ahead of time to look at before you actually have that meeting with them either virtually or on the phone. More interruptions, right? That happens. Um, literally, um, Carrie was actually introducing me. A gentleman walked into the room, so I went back to introduce myself, 
and he <laughs> he was looking for a room with computers in it that's not this room that we're currently in um so interruptions happen kids pop into the picture right um you know people ask questions because they're at home so things like that um communication about technology i, I apologize oh that was access so now just that communication so talking to that patient and say you know i can send you a link to zoom are you familiar with zoom have you used zoom before on your computer because they may have to download something for that things like that um if they had a new email address once again i know when you go to register you you know always ask people tons of questions but making sure that email is the email they wanted to go to um or restarting your computer because zoom pushed out an update last night and now you know i, I know anytime we we know that you have to restart your computer for zoom a lot of us email each other and say hey you have a meeting today go ahead and go in and restart zoom now because you just never know so um, the ability to share the consent on the screen with the participants, I know you're all shocked I jumped ahead, so I talked about that, but being able to share that with them, because they may have that in consent in front of them, but you might be on page two and they're on page seven, right, because that never happens, right, um, so making sure you can actually show that to them. Um, and, and we've all experienced this, you know, that loss, that limited available cues. Um, that we would normally have an in person interaction. Um, so right now I'm sharing so therefore I can't see my audience right so making sure you kind of think about that and we just we lose some of those nonverbal cues on even on zoom right and I'm sure you all can see me still talking with my hands that has not changed. So let's talk about so I, I kind of broke this down into two two ways um so one is obtaining consent with written and then we'll also talk about e-consent as well i just i couldn't talk about e-consent without talking about the written part of it so please bear with me a little bit so um so just to be clear what is written consent um this is um you know our wonderful crfs or cfrs um and it's the informed consent shall be documented by the use of a written consent form of, which we know has to be approved by the IRB, and then it's signed and dated by the subject or could be the subject's LAR at the, oh, sorry, legally authorized representative at the time of the consent. Um, a copy shall be given to that person. So that is what I meant by written consent. It's actually the physical paper that you're providing them. Um, so if you are in person and you're doing, once again, written consent, um, you're going to review the informed consent. Remember, I talked about it's a process. It's not just me handing them a piece of paper and saying, hey, we're going to do a study. You want to sign up? You know, we want to go through the informed consent. Um, so we want to do an overview of the study, explain the study's purpose. What are the procedures? Like I gave the example of, hey, if you're going to draw my blood four times and I pass out the sided needles, I may not want to do the study with you. Um, what are the risks? What are the benefits? Um, you know, this is standard of care, but with the clinical trial, this is going to happen. You know, we're going to do different things in the standard of care. Um, drug, um, you know, comparative agents, um, if applicable. Um, alternatives. Um, so, you know, looking to see, um, making sure they're aware of what are the altern alternatives. I got it. Um, research related procedures. Um, and once again, letting them know at any time they have the right to decline. Um, and as we all know, that's even after they've already signed up, they still have that right to decline. Okay, so just really going through the informed consent with them. Um, we want to provide, once again, written consent, accurate or adequate time to read and review the document. We want to give them that ability to ask questions, right? Um, so making sure they're understanding what you had. Have you ever talked to your kid? How many people have kids? I, I don't, but I have a niece and nephew that might as well be my kids, right? Have you ever talked to someone and they just shut down? You know, they're not, they're like, yeah, mom, I know you want me to come to my room. I'm totally thinking about the game I'm going to go play, right? So, you know, if you have a patient that's done that, you want to ask, you know, let them ask questions, but maybe ask them some questions too, you know, to make sure they comprehend it. Once again, um, encouraging input from family members or other providers. 
Um, if the patient is unable to give consent, um, as we know, we can provide the above information to the subject's legal authorized representative as well. Um, ensure the subject or LAR and investigator delegated staff have personally signed, dated, and sometimes they want the time on it. So making sure that they actually sign that. And then we want to provide a copy of the signed and dated ICF to the subject or LAR. So sometimes you have to think about logistics, right? Because if it's a paper form and now we've all signed and dated it, how are we going to get a copy, right? Um, you know, we might be doing a clinical trial at a hospital down in the southern part of the state and we don't for, we forget to say oh hey do you have a copier that's on the floor that we can run to how is that going to work so making sure you think about that um, and of course the official ICF must be filed within the study record and a copy placed in their medical record as well so not only does it need to stay with the study we want to place a copy in their medical record as well. Because think about this patient may, you know, nine o'clock at night, they get a fever and they come to the emergency room. We want to make sure that physician that's treating them has a copy of that informed consent so they know what's happening with that patient. Because um, the patient may say, yeah, I don't know. I saw the doctor and I signed, I'm in some kind of study or something, right? You never hear that, right? <laughs> So making sure that um, we have a copy in their medical records. Um, and we want to document the ICF process, right, in the subject's record. So some things you want to include, the date, the time, if it's applicable. Um, you want to document that the ICF was signed and all the questions were answered. And then the consent was obtained prior to initiation of any study-related activities, right? Um, and then once again, copy of the signed ICF was given to the subject or LAR. So once again, documenting that process in the subject records as well. So making sure it's documented. Um, just some additional considerations. Um, you know, maybe a subject doesn't speak English. Um, they're unable to read, um, you know, someone that's physically challenged. So um, we actually have an SOP um, with our Center of Excellence. So that is the link down below. So if you need some additional details about that, um, we'll provide these slides after today's training to everybody that attended. So, and we have, I'm, I'm sure, you know, just a plug, we have like 20 SOPs through the Center of Excellence. So if you're interested in that, um, feel free to email myself or Carrie, and we can definitely get you the link to all of them. Or actually, I apologize, that link will take you to all 20 because I couldn't link it directly. I apologize. All right, so let's talk about obtaining consent. So like I said, like I, said I, I broke this into two pieces. So now I want to talk, so thank you for, for sitting with me through the paper form. So let's talk about the electronic informed consent. And of course, we have to have an acronym because, you know, we don't do clinical trials or anything health-wise unless we have acronyms. Um, so our acronym is EIC. Um, and that is the electronic informed consent process. It may be used to supplement or replace paper-based informed consents. Um, they still have to meet regulations, right? Regulations don't go away just because it's electronic informed consent. Um, and your institution requirements, um, whatever they had in person, um, you know, that still has to be, those requirements still have to be met from your institution. Um, once again, discuss the consent process with the subject or LAR and verify the plan is acceptable. Um, because you're going to, what, you're going to need to set up a date and a time that you're available. Um, or if maybe you're not doing the informed consent, but the physician is. So now you've got to go back to the doctor to find out a time they're available and the patient's available as well. So, you know, kind of talking through that plan um, with that um, potential subject. Um, just want to make sure that you have that specific software controls, because once again, we want to ensure the safety of the electronic data and the integrity of the informed consent must also still be in place. Um, because it is FDA regulated, it, any application that you use for e-consent still has to meet 21 CFR Part 11 requirements. That doesn't go away just because it's electronic or electronic informed consent. 
Um, and there could be different types of EIC platforms. Um, I just have a few. I just, you know, your sponsor, if you're working with a sponsor, they may say this is what we're using for electronic informed consent. Um, and you would need to then probably get training on how that works, you know, things like that. Um, so making sure you have those conversations um, with the sponsor as well. Um, here at WVU, um, we also have REDCap or Qualtrics. Um, that's our in-house and it's kind of depending on our study type as well. So those are two things that we do have. Um, and we wanna provide study stuff contact information, right? Because we set up this meeting, we think we're ready to go and then we jump on Zoom and well, patient never joins, right? Well, because something happened, they had to run and go pick up a grandchild or something. So making sure you provide that. So if you're, you know, maybe calling them to set up that meeting or going through email, I'm not sure, um, making sure you provide your number because things happen, right? So, and I mean, that's also, sorry, I gave that example, but that's also later on, right? Because if you're doing everything electronically, I may not have that at my fingertips, right? I have just, I, a year ago, I signed up for research, not a clinical trial, just research here at WVU. I received the electronic informed consent and they actually gave me a piece of paper with their contact info. Because you don't want to go through my personal emails because I, I'm really bad. Don't email me personally because I don't check it. I'll be honest. So, but I have that sheet of paper. I had a problem. I called and they were able to fix it. Um, the IRB submission, um, you really need to provide a clear description of the electronic media. So if you are working with a sponsor, that needs to be in there, like providing those details. Um, and that it also needs to have the confidentiality protection and the timing of the consent process. You know, we're going to, you know, set up a 45 minute Zoom call, you know, what does that look like? So what is that timing? Um, any electronic informed consent should be easy to navigate, right? If you ever been on an application, you're like, I don't even know what button to push next. Like I'm, I'm trying to register for a webinar, but I have no idea where to go now. Um, so it should be easy to navigate because think about, um, I, here's a great example. Um, I was working with a fellow, once again, this is just an example of technology. And I thought it was a good thing to have a QR code. I thought that was something that younger individuals um, might be really great about, but he, he asked me what to do with the QR code. Um, so just helping him navigate that. So once again, that was not research, um, but is that a question? Okay. Um, so allow the user to proceed forwards and backwards. Because think about if you have a paper copy in front of you, you can do that. So they need to be able to do that on their side as well, because you know, you get to page three and it talks about something or it has an acronym and you're like, I don't remember what that was. So make sure they can go back and look at it. And then allow the user to stop and continue at a later time because I'm going through the electronic conform consent. Um, I get to page four. I don't know why I keep giving that example. I get to page four and I have a question and I don't feel comfortable proceeding until I come back and talk to you guys. Um, hyperlinks, this is, this is another great advantage of electronic informed consent. You can put hyperlinks. Um, I actually helped a physician record a video. Um, he was going to put it in part of his informed consent, and he was going to have them watch that video because it was a hyperlink. So once again, great tools now that we can add to that. Um, just, just letting you know, hyperlinks have to be maintained until the completion of the study. And once again, that just to be clear, that video had to be reviewed by IRB and everything. Just if for anybody that's from the IRB, I'm sure I hope you're loving that I'm saying that over and over. Um, so sometimes, um, you know, we're in person doing that electronic form consent. So we are face to face, but instead of having that piece of paper, um, we might be doing electronic informed consent. Um, so once again, you can give them the opportunity to either use paper-based or the electronic informed consent method. So you can't have paper there, um, or you can also say, you know, we do have this electronic informed consent method as well. Um, you're going to complete, I'm not going to go through the steps that I said before, but you're going to do the exact same thing. 
go through it, go over the risks, the benefits, asking questions, all of that. So that was in person. That was easy. That was one slide. <laughs> so now we want to talk about what does remote informed consent look like? So just to let you know, I think I've talked a lot about um, the information can be provided to the subject ahead of time. Okay, so you can fax it, email it, um, or the e-consent e e application um, for review prior to the actual consenting process. Um, so that can definitely be done ahead of time. Um, and that way they have, let's just say, if we're talking about we emailed um, and they have that piece of paper now in front of them or they have it on their screen, they can look at it as well. Um, oh, sorry. Allows the subject or LAR time to review and consider whether or not to participate. Um, the consent review process may be performed by telephone, telephone or video media um, with access to conversation when the subject or subject legal authorized representative can read the consent form during the discussion. Um, once again, a witness um, shall be present during the telephone or video, video, video media consent process. Um, I will say, please also make sure if you're using Zoom or you're using another platform, make sure it is also HIPAA compliant because you're talking to a patient. Um, so making sure that that um, platform is also HIPAA compliant as well. Um, if a written informed consent is needed, um, so maybe you are doing, um, you know, you're talking to them, but it's via Zoom. Um, once the informed consent is received by the study team, that's when you guys would actually go ahead and sign it and date. So your question might be, well, my patient signed it because they live um, three hours away. They signed it on November 20th, but because of the mailing system, I did not get it until today. Should I sign it for that date? Because that's the date I talked to them. And Tanya, I can see your head shaking no, I'm sure because as she's quality, um, we do not backdate. So you would sign it with the date that you received it. Once again, even though you're maybe waiting for that paper copy to come back to you, even though you did it remote over Zoom, let's say, um, you cannot do any research activities until you receive that informed consent back. It is signed and dated, okay? so. You know, even though the mail system's slow, you still have to wait for it. You can't say, hey, can you go ahead and go to the lab and get your blood drawn if that's part of the, if that's part of the clinical trial. Okay. Um, if the paper form, um, the subject or LAR shall, shall sign and date and return it. There's several different ways. They can, they can send it back that same way. You know, if they, if they have a fax, they can fax it back to you, um, a mail, um, put it in the mail, post it. So, the other thing you might want to think about is if you are going to mail it to them ahead of time and have them mail it back to you, um, what about postage, right? We don't want the patient, you know, who's going to pay for that postage? Are we going to get extra envelopes? You know, kind of think about that budgeting wise um, for your clinical trial as well. Um, you can use secure email as well. So, um, or they could just bring it to their next visit. So maybe um, for the clinical trial, um, the first activity they might have to do is get an MRI. Um, so they could bring it to the clinic that day, have that, you know, have the person complete the informed consent, not the subject, they could sign it that day. When they bring it into you sign it as well. And then the patient could go on for the MRI. Um, the investigator delegated staff, I think I've said this multiple times, sorry, shall sign the ICF the date they receive it. And I know those dates could be potentially drastically different and that's okay because once again we don't backdate so we're going to date the date that we actually physically receive it. Um, once again no research activities until that informed consent is signed. Okay. So let's talk about lessons learned. So I did have a couple um, like I said coordinators give me lessons learned so I was pretty excited about that. Um, so first we're going to talk about red cap because we did talk about have, has, have you guys in the room have you guys used red cap for okay. Um, so with red cap, um, just some suggestions, um, a naming convention for the e consent instruments built in red cap is recommended and it should include versioning right because we get the for first informed consent. 
um, that would, let's say version 1.0, right? Um, and you're like, hey, we have this informed consent, we consent 20 patients, and then all of a sudden we get, maybe we're working with a sponsor, and they're like, hey, here's the amendment, here's version 2.0, you know, so making sure, just like you named, I, I kind of see it, I'm very, if you don't know, I'm very big on version control, even my slides have version, everything has my Excel sheets, everything has version control on it. So um, same thing in REDCap, and that way it's very clear which um, e-consent that you're using, which one you're sending to the patient, and all of that's linked with that same name. So um, it's a recommendation that the REDCap administrator or designee um, verifies the initial builds as well as any changes prior to the release if you're not directly involved with the build to ensure the instruments are not overwritten um, and require qualified settings. So, um, and then those involved with auto PDF creation are, are also enabled. So once again, if you're having them maybe build it for you and you're, you weren't involved with that, my recommendation is test, test, test. Um, I talked to a coordinator um, this week and she was like, Debbie, I put in so many informed consents. Um, she said, and her thing was going through it. So she understood what her patients were going to see, but also understanding what type of notifications her patients would be receiving as well. So making sure she understood. So, because um, once again, you don't want to just rely. I mean, I like our red cap administrator, um, but once again, you know, we're human. And they may read stuff, something and, and take it a different way. So once again, just going through it to make sure. Um, PDF should only be provided to participants from the file repository um, where the automatic PDFs are stored to ensure the correct original file is used. Um, data collection instruments should not be built within the same project as informed consent to separate the data from the, in, from the informed consent. I see people shaking their head yes here, so obviously use red cap a lot, so that's good. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about lessons learned. Um, so we talked about um, when you, if you're doing an e-consent or even if you've sent them the piece of paper, but maybe you're talking to them over Zoom, um, making sure when you make that plan with your potential subject, talk to them about junk mail, right? How many times do they get the, the, they're like, I didn't get that email. And you're like, is your email address Debbie.ly? Deb yes, but I, I don't know what you're talking, I don't have no email, right? And, you know, once again, just saying, did you check? Do you have a junk email? And depending on different emails too, it might be called spam uh, as well as so to making sure, so. Um, also, someone let me know um, that they learned this lesson. So I, I love learning from other people's lessons because I make enough mistakes on my own. Um, if there are yes or, yes or no boxes for optional sub-studies that require subjects initials, make sure you inform the REDCap administrator um, because those option items will be moved to the last section of the consent form in REDCap. Um, so the subject can put their um, signature initials there. So I'm not sure if everybody has had sub studies, but if you do, make sure you're talking to your REDCap administrator about that. All right, so I did have somebody submit a question. I was super excited on the RSVP because you, know you know how I love questions. Um, so this person has a few studies um, that has closed. Um, however, the e-consent e form is still in REDCap. How can I inactivate the project? Um, so the I actually reached out to our REDCap administrator. Um, so he actually provided the direct steps on how to, um, if it says inactivate, that's what, yeah. Automatic um, invitation button to the right and then click not active at the bottom of the window that opens. So once again, just providing that. Um, and once again, this might not apply to you right now, but it might, so. Um, he also let me know, um, however, if a project has been marked as completed, um, he believes that you, it will require for him to do the change. Um, so for that person, if, you, if that's the case, um, I just put the Red Cap Administrator email address down there because I'm all about providing you all with resources. So.
Okay. And that and that email is for anybody that's working in Red Cap. You have questions, things like that. Um, I've worked with Ian not on e consent, but I've worked with him with several assessments and things like that. For me, very responsive. Um, I actually emailed him yesterday with this question. Yes, I know I was late, but he responded to me. So, all right. So that is all I had to talk about with e-consent and consenting patients. Um, but I kind of wanted to open it. Has Rosemary joined us? Okay. So I did want to open it up to anybody on the call. I'm actually going to stop sharing just because I want to see people because y'all know how I love people. So my, oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Good. Good. Thank you, facilitator. So Carrie just reminded that somebody may have sent a question directly to me. Um, so give me just one second. I'm just scrolling through to make sure I'm not missing any questions. Okay. Yeah, it looks like we're we're good on this side. Thank you, Carrie. All right. So anybody on the call, do you have any maybe lessons learned that you have had or um, any questions about e-consent that I may not be able to answer, but I have my handy dandy sheet of paper to take a note. I actually have a question and I sent it into the RSVP, but it might've been too late. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Michelle. Oh, that's all right. Um, so this is probably a bit of a dumb question, but no okay. Question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so going back to, you know, the whole, we use the email use agreement in REDCap to um, start that process of getting the consent going. Um, but I wanted to clarify because within that, and this might be a better question for Ian, um, it gives a warning, like if you have, you know, any identifying information, you probably shouldn't attach the PDF of the consent because there's like a, an option for that, for sending um, the completed consent form as an email once they finish it. So my question here is, any consent is going to have the identifying information of their name. Is that what that's considering? Am I allowed to send them their consent that way? Or what is the process for giving them their consent if I'm completing a consent with them in person electronically? Um, that is a great question. And I'm gonna see, um, I see that Tanya and Shelly are on the call. Um, do either one of you know the answer? Hi, Tanya. Hi. Um, I don't want to answer this for certain. Um, so we don't have um, Rosemary that has joined. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. My understanding, unless that has changed, was there was a, a method to that was approved to send securely um, the fully signed PDF to participants through a secure email process, and it should be described in the instructions from the um, OHRP website. Um, but maybe we can clarify that and send um, that information to everybody on the call. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So excellent question, Michelle. Thank you. We will definitely get back, and we'll get back to everybody, not just Michelle. So. We'll <laughs> We will share that well. So thank you for that question, Michelle. Thank you both. All right. Anybody else with any questions or comments? I see maybe. Alice? I have a question, Debbie. Hey, Alice. It's Alice. Um, I was asked by Monor yesterday. So if we have no access to a copier after patients sign the consent, um, here is a few um, choices we do, like we tell the patient, come back to the office, make a copy, mail to them later. Or can we run two consent forms and sign both of them by patient and the staff, then give one of them to patient right after the consent form is signed. Um, What's your suggestion? Sure, that is also a, a great question. Um, I know that that has come up before, and I, I believe Tanya, do you have a Tanya or Shelly? Have you seen that happen before? Or what What is your recommendation? Um, could you 
just to make sure that I understood the question correctly, could you um, repeat what you So for, um, for sure, we like, you know, we go to, I think for this study, he goes to a dental office. Like, you know, he, he said that if I have no access to a printer or copier, I can't make a copy of the signed consent you gave it to a patient. Um, I said, maybe you'll come back to the office, make a copy, then mail the consent to a patient later. I think this one is acceptable, right? Or he said, how about I bring two consent form? We sign both of them, then just give one to patient to take home. That way I don't have to mail it a copy to a patient later. So I wasn't sure what's the best practice. So my understanding from the regulations and I, I see Shelly has um, popped into um, the box as well. Um, the regulations ask that there be one original sign mm -hmm. and then you can make copies. So it would not be recommended to find two different copies of the same consent at the same time, mm -hmm. because not confirm which is the actual original. So that's why you sign one original copy mm -hmm. and, and then make a photocopy of that original that. that you remain with just one original document. Um, and then with regards to the um, logistics of how to provide that copy to the participants, I can, I can um, send that over to Shelly. Yeah, it's fine to mail it. I, I would agree with um, with your answer. That is the best um, case scenario is, you know, you've got a Xerox machine and it's right there and you hand it to them. But if not, I mean, it, it, it regulations and practice doesn't say you have to give it immediately. I mean, mm. you'd like to because that's the easiest, right? But you can mail it. Mail it late. <laughs> mail it later. Uh, thank you. Sure. Good questions. Yeah, I love, I love mm -hmm. it. Any other questions or comments? Do you have a, do you have a question or? Okay, do you, would you mind coming up to the mic or, sorry about that. No, you're fine. <laughs> Hold up, we have a question or a comment in the room, so. comment is really just pretty simple. If anybody wants to practice on me um, before they, they deploy something, I would be more than happy to be a learner in that moment while also helping them um, know the patient kind of experience. So I volunteer myself to be anybody's. Oh, um, awesome. okay. <laughs> so it was really just a comment, but it's yeah. me begging somebody to try them on me. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you for that. And remind me, it's Ky Kylie, Kylie, and I, I apologize. You're uh, Kimberly, Kimberly Kadata or Kadata. So yes, thank you. Would you Would you mind if we put your email? It, it, I can put it in the email when we send it out. If that is that okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. We appreciate it. Wow, we've never had volunteers volunteer for stuff. That's awesome. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a great, no, it's a great learning all the way around. I'm all about, you know, training as practicing and putting it into practice. So awesome. maybe um, because they offer to practice, maybe it would be good for you to let everyone know that you also offer, or, you, you know, you have um, as an option, a separate informed consent process that you offer. Do you want to um, let everybody know about that? Sure. Yeah. So um, if you have, um, you know, sometimes the where it's come from i've had e, it's called e-consent training um it's different from this some of the slides are the same i'm going to be honest but we also um talk about some of the logistics we talk about for example the delegation of duties log that that needs to be signed off you need to be you know an informed consent you need to be qualified um and i've done that training um from being on zoom with individuals to on the fly um, you have maybe a group of interns that, you know, will be doing some informed consent training with this particular clinical trial. 
reach out to me. I can come to you. I can do whatever's needed. Um, I do have also a video. So, um, so before I've had, um, actually the last one I can remember was the PhD students. Um, and I had PhD students and they all couldn't attend at the same time. Um, so they, others were able to watch the video and still be able to do the informed consent process as well. So feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I, as Carrie said, everybody knows me, I guess, um, which that comment came from a physician this week. So maybe so, which not sure good or bad, um, but um, so feel free. It's good. Okay. So feel free um, to email me and I can definitely get you either set up for training or I can get you the video as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Tanya. All right. Any other questions or comments on this Friday afternoon? All right. Just a reminder, I think Carrie put it in the chat, but just one more time, if you need continuing education credit, your WVU staff member, um, please just put your name in email, um, put CE, and we'll definitely um, get that form to you. We are going to have a tight turnaround for the form. So just, just putting that out there, um, because as you all know, it's end of year. Um, so we need to get our invoice ready um, from the continuing education office. So, all right. Well, thank you so much everyone for attending, um, everyone on Zoom. I'd love to see all the faces for people in person. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon, everyone.